Thank you, Satya. Good evening uh, to all the Praktani brothers from around the globe, as well as all the guests who have joined us today. I welcome you all to the 32nd Adda session. Uh, in, in this Adda session, we uh, invite our alumni as a speaker to share their experiences, to share their knowledge with all of our, all of our alumni brothers as well as the guests, so that uh, they can learn something from them and get inspired and, and be more successful. And one other reason for organizing this Adda is to have a platform where our alumni brothers can come together and know each other and also can create a stronger bond. In general, the Adda is divided into two parts. In the first part, the, our speaker will uh, share PPT with us. And in the second part, uh, there will be a Q&A round wherein we all can ask our speaker about any of the questions which we have. So today, the speaker uh, we have today with us has done his bachelor's and master's from one of the prestigious uh, universities in India, and that is Indian Institute of Science, Indian Institute of Science, Bangalore. And then he went on to do his PhD from another prestigious uh, institution, uh, that is uh, Marie Curie Industrial Training Network. He's currently working as scientist. Yeah, Deepan, uh, do you uh, wish to say something? Uh, the Marie Curie uh, is not an institution. The institution is Technical University of Munich. Okay. Um, I, I did my doctorate as a part of the Marie Curie Consortium. So the institution is not very good. Thank, Thank you, you uh, for correcting me. Uh, then he's uh, he's currently working as scientist uh, in in one of the pharma company in Germany. So please help me welcome the speaker for today's Adda, Deepan Ghost. Deepan Ghost, the stage is all yours. Right. So let me share the with PowerPoint I made. Here it is. Can you see the PowerPoint? No, I don't think so. It that. Yes, I did uh, see it for a moment. Then... Wait, I, I I shared the screen. Otherwise, it will not work when I when I do the presentation. Yeah. So can you see the PowerPoint now? Yes. Yeah, I can. Okay, great. So um, as a as a brief background so so uh, first of all before i even begin i would like to sort of mention that um this uh, this, this is supposed to be an adda right so this is an informal sort of a um, meeting this is not supposed to be scientifically or otherwise very rigorous so i've not done a very accurate or you know like very scientifically rigorous presentation that's not the purpose of this so there is, uh, I, I have borrowed slides and I have borrowed pictures from different sources um, and so on, which is generally like, so you should properly cite them and so on, but I have not done a very scientifically rigorous job because this is supposed to be an ad that is supposed to be just an informal um, information sharing platform. And that aside, so um, I started my um, journey into science with biology as my major. So mathematics never quite worked for me very well. Um, but so I, uh, but biology was uh, my field of choice. So I started in biology, but um, sort of swerved into chemistry because I found out fairly early on that core biology, like pure biology is not to my liking that much. I tried doing molecular biology and I didn't really like it. So I sort of switched to an interdisciplinary in between, which was chemical biology. And that eventually led me to this, to, to my doctorate project, which was, um, which was part of this Marie Curie consortium that, um, that Vikash was mentioning. So these Marie Curie industrial doctorates, it's a very, um, it's a very prestigious and a very good um, uh, fellowship that uh, the European, that's provided and funded by the European Union. And this is an industrial doctorate, meaning that you do a part of your doctorate in an industry setting, meaning in a company. So you work in the company as a PhD student and your salary is paid by this Marie Curie Foundation. So this, this exposes you to both sides of the field, to both of the players. It, 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 it exposes you to academia because of course your, your doctorate degree comes from an academic institution. So you're still working in an, in an academic setting, 
but you are working in a company at the same time. So that that provides a very, in my case, it was really beneficial and um, it provided me a very good way to sort of transition over into academia. And um, and um, so I'm still doing research, but um, not in an academic setting, in, in, a, in, a, in a company, in an industrial setting. So this, this uh, as I was mentioning that I um, uh, studied chemical biology and this interdisciplinary sort of a field that led me to, to this um, field of drug discovery and, and, and pharma industry basically. And uh, so as we will see that drug discovery and pharma is a very interdisciplinary field. So it's, um, it's really useful to have a diverse background because all so a very a lot of different fields sort of come together to um, to contribute their knowledge here so in in this presentation i'll just very you know i i'll provide a bird's eye view a, a very glancing overview of the drug discovery drug discovery pipeline um so I'll not go into detail into any one section of it. I'll just, I'm just trying to provide a layman's understanding of how a new drug comes to the market, right? So let's begin. And so as a as an outline of the talk and how this talk is going to be like sort of, um, how this talk is going to go, um, the, the drug discovery pipeline, the entire process is the guide of the talk. So there are sort of four distinct phases to a drug discovery process, starting from uh, the research phase. So at the, at the extreme left, you have research and at the extreme right, you have a commercial drug. So uh, a, uh, a drug is taken up like, so um, from conception to marketing, there are these phases. So we have drug discovery and then preclinical pre development. And, and after, after preclinical development, we have um, a compound. So after like here, we have a compound that is, um, that has shown efficacy that we know that it works in, 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 in animal models at least. And then after it has proven in animals, we move to these clinical trials and there are three phases with increasing number of volunteers. We'll discuss the, this in a little bit more detail. Um, and then after the clinical trials, we are confident that the drug works in humans and there are no side effects or there are no adverse, significantly adverse side effects. Or if they are, they are known to us, so they're manageable. Once that is done, then the, then the drug authorities, like in, in USA, that would be FDA, Food and Drug Administration, and there is a similar body for Europe. Um, so they these these and there is also, there is also an authority like that for India. So every every country or region has one of these um, food and drug authority. They they review the the clinical trials and they they have a whole process that they go through and then they approve the drug that yes this drug can be sold, and then. You know, then uh, other companies are brought in who actually help manufacture the drug. Um, India is heavily in this section. In India is very relevant in this section, not not so much in the earlier processes. Uh, and then after after mass manufacturing is done, then it is uh, it is brought to the market. And then as as a um, for every drug, the the population is monitored for any adverse side effect that or that did not get caught in the clinical trials. So there is a post-marketing post surveillance. That's the very brief overview. So now we will look a little bit into more detail into each of these phases. I'm not going to go into um, uh, a lot of detail because that, that is just way too much. So, and, and each of these steps, there are, are dedicated companies who just do that. So there are companies who are focused on drug discovery, not just drug discovery, a very slim part of the drug discovery process. There are companies who actually do clinical trials, just clinical trials and nothing else. 
so you can you can probably guess how vast of a process this is this takes years even decades so uh, typically for a drug to get from conception to uh, marketing it's it's about 10 years in an average case it can take a decade it can take two decades but it's usually 10 years that's the sort of the average case so let's look at the drug discovery part of this in a little bit more detail and this is where the all the scientific development happens this is this is where most of the research is uh, is concentrated and so um so for example in my company we are entirely based we are entirely focused on this part and not even all of the five steps here we are just focused on uh, until step three so heat to lead that's why it's called lead discovery center the company name is lead discovery center because we are focused uh, we are trying to get compounds from heat to lead and so so I, I'll, I'll sort of go through briefly in, in, in each of these five steps what they mean and discuss that a little, little bit and then move on to the to the next steps so so for to develop a drug we need to find a target and what do i mean by target a target is what that drug acts inside the body so uh, most of the drugs have a target a known target that that particular drug affects now this process may not be entirely linear so it's, it's possible that initially when you find an active compound you do not know the target of that so it can be that it is sort of backwards that you do not you, you do not know the target but you have a compound it's also possible that you you have a target but you do not know the compound that acts on that target so this can happen in both ways and so i'll skip this for a moment so here if you see this cycle so we have target identification and we can go up like this so we want a compound and we then do target discovery and then we find the target or we can have a compound and then do something called a target deconvolution and then find the target so this can happen in both ways so we can have a compound but not the target and we can have the target but not the compound but in any case we need um, at the at the end of this whole process at the end of this whole cat and, cat and mouse game we either we, we, we identify a target and a compound that affects the target so we have a pair we have a, so these these targets are typically proteins inside the body it can also be rnas or or dnas uh, of course but most of the time it's proteins it's proteins more often than not As there are of course um, some um, cancer cancer treating um, drugs that 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 binds the dna so but for simplicity's sake i will just i'll just mention that uh, the targets are typically proteins that are inside the cell that are doing various jobs that you want to sort of target, disrupt, or enhance, or whatever, whatever, whatever you want to do. But you find a target, a druggable target that can be drugged, and then you find a hit that affects that target. So here I have a little bit of an analogy, and that this is uh, this is borrowed from Dr. J. Bradner, who is who is in Novartis a big pharma company and he so he sort of compares this finding a target business to to pastas and i don't know if this, this is very relevant to indian folks because you know we, we don't uh, in these days probably people still understand but in any case so you have different kinds of pastas which have a filling like imagine dumplings so we have a starchy coat and inside there is a filling so there are some some pastas which have already been filled likewise there are proteins which already has known targets so here, this is EGFR, EGF receptor, and the molecule in green, in, in sorry, sorry, in purple here is gefitinib. That's a that's a cancer drug. So here we have a we have a pair, but the, the protein has already been targeted with known drugs. So that's less useful. And here there is a there is a uh, target, which looks like it can be filled. There there can be proteins that can fit into the pocket here but it hasn't been filled yet so this is this is this will be the definition of a druggable target so you are looking for something in 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 the body that that fits this criteria that looks like it could be filled but it hasn't yet there are of course uh, proteins that 
are it's, it's like spaghetti so it's like di disordered or, or uh, like in, 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 intrinsically disordered proteins these are called so they are they don't have a defined structure or or they don't have any defined pockets that are known so it's hard to imagine how to fill it so it, it it's a, it can be a target but it is it is not a druggable one so so we need to find a druggable target to sort of kick this thing off as it were so once we have a, a target and a, a molecule that fits that target we can do we can do heat identification and validation and so uh, just just before i go to that step there is there is there's, there could be uh, another step here so here let's see so we have we have we have identified the target and then we make a bunch of compounds uh, so we, we we sort of do what is called a high throughput screening so we take a whole lot of compounds like hundreds of thousands even millions of compounds and then we just screen that target against the compound. So we are just firing at the wall and see what sticks, basically. And at the at the end of this high throughput screening, what you get is a, is a set of compounds that are called hits. And these hits are what what um, in the high throughput screening they are active against our target. So it sort of interacts with the target in some capacity or the other. Uh, not necessarily with the target per se, but it affected the assay in some sense. So we have a lot of compounds that um, shows this activity, but then we need to sort of uh, sort of go through that list and find out what are actually affecting the target and not an artifact of the assay. So this is where false positives in high throughput assay comes in. And um, there are there are lots of strategies and lots of you know lots of scientific research and my PhD was related to this. Um, it was related to finding high throughput, uh, sorry, false positives in high throughput assays. But anyway, we need to find out what are the true hits, what are the real uh, sort of compounds that interact with our target. Once we have that, then we can go into the next step. So we do this validation of hits, and this is this entails a lot of you know sort of. Um, sort of a lot of orthogonal checking. So you, you, you take, you test the same compound and the same protein in a different assay. These are called orthogonal assays and, and so on. I will not go into the details of this, but you validate, you make sure that the compound definitely interacts with the target. And then once you have that, then you know that you have a promising compound that can be further um, developed. And this is where compound development happens. So this is this is the this is a sort of, sort of nice um, simplified view of the early stage drug discovery, and then this. So we have identified our hits. Where is the mouse pointer? Here we go. So we we have identified our hits, and then we need to turn that hit into a lead, and this is where a lot of chemical optimization on the compound happens. So there is this cycle. There is this cycle that goes on. So you design a molecule and then you make that molecule, chemical synthesis, and then you test that compound against your target, you know, in some kind of an assay. And then you do, you, then you evaluate the properties, the pharmacological properties of the molecule. So ADMET and PK is pharmacokinetics and ADMET is, um, ADMET is, is, is an acronym for five different properties. So T is toxic, the toxicity, uh, and M is metabolism, D is distribution, A is absorption, and so on. So you look at all of the properties of of that compound, and uh, and then uh, and then you keep doing this, and you keep little variation on on the compound. So you change the compound a little bit and see what what properties changed. And by doing this, you can you can sort of build a map. You can sort of figure out what what kind of modification steers you to a better compound. And this is known as structure activity relationship. Uh, and so you keep on doing this. So this is a, this is a cycle that that happens in, in passes. So you, every compound that that uh, enters through this um, this heat identification process goes through this optimization cycle a few times. And, and and in each pass, it gets refined a little bit. The activity becomes better. It becomes a better binder. It affects the if it affects the compound. It, it binds to the protein better, 
and and also you have to keep in mind that you have to you have to put this into the body at some point so you need to be wary of these these um, pharmacological properties that you need to also monitor it's not enough to have a compound that is that is very good at binding to the protein if it is very toxic if it is very toxic it will kill the it will kill your kill your host so that that would not help so uh, so this is done and then at the end of this uh, hit to lead and lead of opti lead opti optimization this is called um, then you have a lead and then the lead goes into the the preclinical phase and from there it goes into the the clinical trials so here is a here is a nice infographic of clinical trials and clinical trials has typically three phases the fourth phase is is sometimes it's, it's not uh, always there but three phases are always there so uh, you uh, as you can see here that this is done um, with an increasing amount of time so phase one is one year phase two is two years and phase three is about one to four years and this has done in series. So phase one, and then after phase two, and then after phase three. So, so here alone, it will take one, two, and so in the worst case, it will be four to six, seven years right here. So, and, and so just to, just to get a compound through clinical trials is five, six, seven years. So that's why drug development is, is a very slow process it, because you do not want to get it wrong. Because if you get it wrong, that is that is really bad news, and that has happened in the past. So, so that's why there are very stringent criteria, and and it's better to get it slow and get it correct than to hurry it up and 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 you know mess it up. So that's why it's done with with quite a bit of rigor, and and so there are so in in the phase one is just a small group of people. So, and there are also consideration what age group and so it, like the the trials make sure that the drug is tested on all age groups and all ethnicities and and whatnot so these are all taken into consideration and as you move from phase one to phase two to phase three these considerations are expanded so phase three will be a general sort of a trial where it includes all age groups and all ethnicities so that there is uh, there is no surprises when the drug is actually released in the market. So once 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 the phase three trial is complete, then the the authorities um, give a clear. So so they 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 allow the drug to be brought into the market, and then as I was showing earlier, that then the the manufacturing industries are brought in. And then, so they are they are given the, the the formula of the compound, and then they they use their industrial expertise to synthesize that compound in a large scale, and then they are marketed under under their name, whatever the company decides that name to be. So there is a whole licensing agreement and and other um, bureaucratic process that needs to go on. So whoever developed, so usually because you can see this is a massive process, right? So it's not always the case that one company came up like one company did this whole thing on their own. So there are there there are there there will be industrial partners along the way. So there are negotiations on who gets to keep what share what market share of the product in the end. And, and 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 so on but i will not i will not go into that anyway so this is a this is a nice chart that i found so here this shows um success rate of clinical trials so going from phase 1 to phase 2 to phase 3 and and so on so as you can see that phase 2 to phase 3 has the lowest success rate so um it it, it is only 30% so one third of the drugs go on move on uh, and if you look at the overall phase one to approval, that's only 9.6%. So roughly less than 10% of the drug that comes out of the research phase actually comes to the market. Um, this is this is because of the stringency that I mentioned that it, it needs to be tested in all sectors, in all all populations of um, of humans to make sure that there are there are no side effects or there are no um, uh, nastiness lurking within so many a times that is found out in these clinical trials and then they are rejected 
and the and the drug is that doesn't come to the market so right now there are like there are hundreds if not thousands of drugs sitting somewhere along this pipeline sitting somewhere along these phase 1 to phase 3 clinical trials for all kinds of diseases but then they never then they may never come to the market and so here uh, it is a brief chart is brief table of the market shares of uh, sorry the market, not the market share the economics of um, drug discovery and you can see what phase takes how much money and what share of the entire process so because phase phase 3 clinical trial is is very expensive so it it has to be at least 100 participants and it has to be um, across all age groups and all ethnicities so that costs quite a lot quite a lot of money but beyond that we have so after that we have the pre human or the the research phase of this that also costs quite a bit of money and and here is a big big picture of this so to bring it all back from early phase research to to uh, coming to the market it takes about 10 years and this this is this industry spans a whole lot of fields so there are academias and research research companies and uh, other other companies who who are um, who are invested in the early phase research they are actually doing the the development and the research that needs to be done to develop a new chemical entity uh, and then and then there are and the, and then as the compound moves up the chain there are other partners like uh, cont uh, contract research organizations cro's and government regulatory agencies like fda and then there are healthcare professionals like doctors who who do the post marketing surveillance and and that that's a for like that's an ongoing process but for for a drug to come from here to to registration and marketing that takes about 10 years as you can see here so 10 to 15 years that's that's sort of the the, the average yes so i hope that was a uh, um, a brief enough overview of the drug discovery pipeline. I did not go into detail of any of this for, uh, for because this, I intended this to be a general talk, not, not a very focused one. So if you have any questions, then uh, ask away and thank you for your attention. Uh, thank you Deepan for your uh, session. I have one question, like during the corona, I, I think when the world was logged, and mm -hmm. we didn't had any uh, like vaccine for that. So which mm. stage was skipped in that scenario? Like yeah, very good question. Exactly. As as, as thinking, I will mention this. So here in 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 let's see which I think the first slide is best. Yeah. So for for the COVID vaccine, this step was skipped. The drug discovery and the preclinical was was skipped mostly and clinical trials was accelerated so it, it it still went through so if you look at the 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 covid vaccines that came to the market you can find out the that which which trials they actually went through so i think when who declared the covid pandemic within a month there were there were compounds in the clinical trials because that is because um, the 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 covid virus is a known virus and we had um, good knowledge about the virus already because this is this is a flu like virus so uh, and 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 so other coronaviruses there were this h1n1 um, not a pandemic but in, but a breakout before so and and there were work that was already done to that which was directly applicable here and that is why we could borrow a lot of that knowledge. And so it did not take that long for people to come out with, with something that actually worked, but the one year delay or one, one, one and a half, two years, that was, you know, that the delay was mostly in the clinical trials because it, it, it takes a minimal amount of time 
if you want to test it in in these number of people you know you need to test them because otherwise it, it can go horribly wrong so in order to do that the a minimal amount uh, at least a year is required so so that is that is where most of the time was spent because we, we came up with the vaccine pretty quickly but it, it took some time to get it actually to the market and then then there was there was uh, i think manufacturing was fairly quick um and typically uh, a, a drug takes some time to get get through the regulatory review but that was expedited so every step of the way here so sort of started here and then went on and every step of the way was expedited it was made super fast okay i have a question dipan yeah yeah so uh, is is it true that uh, with the onset of artificial intelligence it has made an impact on your drug discovery sure i mean uh, it it definitely has made an impact because so a lot of early stage drug discovery is now assisted with with machine learning um, my 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 doctorate was on using using machine learning to identify these these false positives as i was mentioning Mm -hmm. so uh, so so in in these target identification and validation there are so in, in almost in every step here there is a lot of computational work involved and and ai can help that for example alpha fold has now um, sort of quote unquote solved the structures of all known proteins and in some cases that is really helpful uh, the accuracy of of those solves has to be taken with a pinch of salt but it's still better to have something than to have nothing at all hmm. so yeah sure that definitely has made an impact but um uh, a trained um, scientist's opinion is still required that's for sure hmm. Hmm, thanks uh, satyam uh, I mean, yes i have a couple of questions uh, so first of all uh, what uh, so in the regulatory review part so what yeah. we see that and so what we see and read about is a number of medicines that are allowed in india are not allowed in foreign jurisdictions say usa mm. so whether it is the so the regulatory review process differs from country to country and are there any internationally uh, agreed upon uh, some processes that has to be followed because otherwise this discrepancy should not arise uh, and then the second question that i have is uh, so these uh, research processes so this research usually is taken by uh, either by globally is it taken by mostly pharmaceutical companies or uh, government sponsored research organizations because in india uh, so is, is the situation different globally and in india because in india we don't see many uh, like uh, research uh, ma many medicines getting approved or come coming up so it mostly comes up uh, after it is uh, so after the patents are over and india then produces a cheaper versions of those so so why is this discrepancy I, I, so mostly whether in india we need more of uh, government support towards these discovery processes or maybe because we don't have a big pharma companies in india so that is why we are lagging behind yeah nice good questions um, i think I, i'll answer the second one first uh, so yes this is very different actually in 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 india and in the in the west uh, so in as as a, as i like sort of very briefly mentioned that india is where the manufacturing happens but you do not see the the clinical research in india um this is partly because of um, this this has to do with funding but keep in mind that most of these research are done by by pharma companies so they are not not done by uh, by um, educational institutions um they are not done in academia they are mostly in in industries like big pharma companies like astrazeneca and um, and pfizer and so on so most of the research comes from that and we do not have any of these companies in in india 
so we do not have any um, clinical research uh, going on that much in india manufacturing so after they they have the go ahead from the authorities they come to us for manufacturing and in fact in fact for example i can i can give an industrial insight here for example in our company we do the research we we decide what compounds we want so so this is not in this is not in the in the in the regulatory phase or after the regulatory phase in the research phase itself as i as i was talking right that you need to make these variations the small variations and test the compounds there is a cycle that goes on for optimizing the molecule so you need to make these molecules right somehow and and who makes those molecules we do not make them we do so like my company doesn't make the molecules we have indian companies who actually make the molecules for us so we do the research and we hire companies who make the molecules and that that is how it is i i i do not know um, i cannot i cannot give a probably a straight answer why it is that way but i uh, it, it it has to do with the 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 whole economic situation and and everything i guess but i do not know why that is but it, it is true that it is very different so in the west there is a lot of um, there is a lot of research that actually happens in in companies most of the clinical research is actually in companies and what was the other question the other question was regarding so some medicines they are uh, uh, approved in india and not approved in us oh yeah the the regulatory process yeah um, i i i am not very certain why there is a discrepancy like that but the regulatory authority of um, a country can decide that they would not allow that so they can look at the regulatory process that the other the other regulatory authority did because these are all public and then they can decide whether they would allow that or not and there are so for example i think there is a so the so the the european authorities and the and the american authorities they have a, they have an agreement uh, so i i do not know this is the case but they might have an agreement in that case approved by one is approved by the other but that's not that's not true so it can be like that but usually it's like so the each authority takes its own decision so a drug that is approved by the fda has has also be approved by the european authority to be sold in in europe so there is no there is no overall um overall overarching um, commission who actually decides in this this is up to up to the individual authorities okay thank you thank you so much um shanti uh yes i have a question uh, thank you very much for the insightful talk and we got to know about the dis drug discovery pipeline uh one question that every common man is interested in is can we treat cancer and if not why we cannot treat the cancer and what do you think that if ai or machine learning or deep learning can help to solve this problem or not uh, i would say that the question is is a little bit too broad so if you if you ask from a completely naive perspective whether the cancer is treatable or not the answer is going to be yes and no right because some form forms of cancer is indeed very treatable um and some form of cancer is completely untreatable like or not completely but more or less untreatable and it also depends i mean it, it cancer is such a such a huge thing you know it's, it's there are so so many variables that putting it all in a, in a in a one bucket calling it cancer uh, is is not going to it's not it's not get you to a satisfactory answer so indeed modern medicine has made a, a lot of progress and indeed many forms of cancers if especially if caught early is very treatable and and completely treatable you can make a full recovery um, but if that 
if that cancer is caught in at a late stage in a very old person then it becomes very difficult because uh, you know you need to the, the body must be able to withstand the the treatment so that 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 may not always be possible so there are trade offs and that, that's why it's not a it's not a it's the answer is going to be yes and no and yeah, regarding yeah. machine learning and ai you know it's, it's also uh, uh, similar sort of an argument that yes it will help in some aspects of drug discovery but it is not a magic bullet it's not going to solve your problems all of a sudden it's just an algorithm oh, thank you yeah is it because yeah yeah. Uh, so I wanted to ask another question. Uh, the first question is that uh, whether the uh, current form of vaccine is like safe to use, and the other another question is uh, like, what all are the things like uh, which a person should be uh, like should know before he starts a PhD? Like, this is this is a more general question. Like, mm, okay. if, if, if I want to start a PhD, like uh, I should be uh, very careful about all those things and get get, get them sorted. Okay, um, so the vaccines, yes, they, they they are safe. If they are not safe, they would not be like allowed. So um, I mean, I I cannot speak that confidently about the the Indian vaccines, I guess, but because I I didn't look at the 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 review process that that went through and that is not not sold in other markets. But the mRNA vaccines that that's available now widely are very safe, and all the all the vaccines that are in general available are very safe. There, there should not be any concerns about about the vaccines. That's no that that they are of course safe. Otherwise, they would not be allowed. So, and regarding doing a PhD, so. Um, I think the the litmus test is whether you are passionate about the topic or not. So if you are really interested in 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 research in in scientific um, research, you should be able to find that out. You should be able to answer that question yourself um, by by the time you are done with your masters. And whether you are interested in 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 scientific research or not, if yes then you go for a phd if not it might be um might be ill advised i mean it, it might not be your cup of tea and then you find out that you don't really like it so it, it depends so you have to be passionate and so I, I always say that two things a doctorate always teaches you so having a doctorate degree you this will like be proven that you have perseverance and persistence so it doesn't matter in, in which field you do the degree in. I mean, I don't know about the art art fields, the art side of things, but in science, this is definitely true. Doesn't matter wh what your field is, but if you do a doctorate, you will be taught a lesson in, in perseverance and persistence. You have to have the capability to persevere in your endeavors. So if you think you are cut out for that, then sure but if you don't think that you would like to pursue a topic and persist in it then may not be your cup of tea that's the most important thing i would say passion and persistence uh, thank uh, you dipon i have a question but i'm not being able to figure out how how to raise my hand here uh, <laughs> sure is, no problem this is gautam so uh, i have a question about the clinical trials yeah right. so um phase one yeah uh, for the subjects that undergo the trials seems mm -hmm. to be quite uh, risky isn't it because uh, they are the first batch of people human beings on which the drug is being test tested so what really are the ethical issues involved here and uh, what are the incentives for uh, the people willing to undertake uh, such risks so for example are they paid more or or what how how, how do you handle this 
I I mm, I cannot really answer that like very definitely because I do not really know. I have to ask around and find out myself. But the the a uh, drug that is in phase one clinical trial, there is a lot that is known about it already. So the risk. So yes, the risk is in theory higher than phase two or phase three. but it is not so high that is going to endanger the life of of anyone who is being who is volunteering there so there are animal model tests and and a whole series of tests that has already been done to prove that it is safe with the dosage that is prescribed so we may not there might be some minor side effects that is not known about in humans but apart from that uh, it is not going to be dangerous that, that that much i can confidently say but the the ethical issues how they are, they are handled in some way there are there is of course some ethical issues as you have rightly pointed out but how they are exactly handled i actually do not know okay uh, no just a follow up question on that how are we even confident enough that they are relatively safe because they have been tested on animal models mm-hmm. and there are cases in which uh, animal models differ substantially from so uh, by by that time we know where in the body it goes yeah. and what the target is and how fast that clears out of the body and so uh, animal model is a model because we know in which ways it is related to the human body right mm. so it it so for for example for some drugs a mice model is not enough you mm. need to do a dog or a monkey model even yeah exactly so so because because a mice model fails in the in in case of that particular drug it doesn't work so you need a a, a model that works for that drug to be able to approximate a human being so that has that has to be done and and that that is done but with a new drug you wouldn't know which models would work and which models wouldn't isn't that the case no 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 you, you would know because you know the target okay you know the target and the pharmacological properties of the molecule okay. you know where it is where it is going and you know so for example if your protein that you are targeting is similar between let's say human and chimps but is very different between human and mice then a mice model would not work you have mm. to go to a chimp model yeah the other thing i wanted to ask you about is uh, goes back to a previous question uh, about drug development it right. seems to me the main reason that uh, Uh, it doesn't happen in india mm-hmm. uh, or doesn't happen that much is because of the cost mm. so uh, i don't think indian farmers have the muscle power to you know the financial power to get into it however why can't the state take these things up so for example if they can run a space program which i assume is quite expensive and run it very successfully uh, a similar venture should be possible it doesn't have to be left entirely to uh, business houses what do you think yes yes um, that, that that is true i mean the, the drug discovery is 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 a very expensive endeavor indeed so mm. that sounds Mm, possible but i i do not know why the why there is little government support from the indian government in this field that i i cannot answer that the other issue could be of course the development of generics since that is uh, quite a, an industry here probably the drug companies think let's wait a few years then we can develop a, a generic version of the same And, no, after the patent patent expires you mean yes after of course after the patent expires yeah can't... that 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 could be that that practice has a, a sort of a negative effect i 
I do not know why. So, so in general, what I would say is that in terms of R and D, India is very weak. Mm, yes. Believe me, I I have experienced um, <laughs> I have experienced the best research India has on mm. offer. Yeah. So, with from that perspective, I can confidently say that R and D is India is pretty weak in general, and that mostly has to do with money. Mm. There is not enough funding available. Simple as that. From the government, from I mean, research primarily is funded by taxpayers' money, mm. by the government. So that is not not there enough, and that has gotten worse in in the, in recent years. Mm. So India has never been a big player in in R and D. R and D has never been the strong suit of India. So that I think reflects. In in pharma sector as well. Very 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 interesting talk, Dipan. Thank you very much. Really enjoyed it. Thank you for attending it. Anybody else has any questions? No. Okay. Oh. If anyone else has any question, they can ask. Uh, else, we will uh, move towards wrapping up this session. Um, Deepan, yeah. I'm Doctor Dan. I just a small question. Actually, these drug trials, mm -hmm. uh, uh, it depends on the disease. Say you see newer. Uh, I'm talking on the perspective of cancer, right? Okay. Uh, nowadays the research is basically going uh, going out to find the target antigens which mm -hmm. helps in carcinogenesis and so that uh, the drugs are developed to attack that uh, particular site hmm? i am okay. talking about layman's term so a targeted therapy now in these cases many new drugs come out and they are given certain numbers mm -hmm. i think in, in the clinical trial in these cases they recruit uh, disease person, they take their. Oh yeah, about, yeah. Of yeah. course, of course. I mean, it's yeah, even, that 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 that's yeah. Of course, it's I a mean, <laughs> yeah. It's a different type of clinical trial. No, right, uh, right. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, so there are. I I, I cannot. You probably can like um, give more instances of this, but there are cases where these these compounds that are in clinical trials are are um, given to morbid morbid patient yeah 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 right yeah so yeah. for whom there is no other therapy available there is no other way exactly so then that risk is worthwhile taking and we get the data out of it as well yeah yeah because uh, uh, just uh, somebody was asking about uh, the ethical considerations now in yeah, these yeah, yeah. in these cases the uh, the uh, patients are explained and they opt for it they offer, yeah, yeah. Of, this is this is yeah, this is um very yeah, that, very, very good point. Yes, I missed that. That makes yeah. a lot of sense, of course. Yeah, yeah. yeah. The, yes, the other yes. thing is that if you I think so, because I am I, I'm basically a doctor, so uh, what I am hearing these days and coming into contact is that uh, the uh, many of the clinical trials, the research part is not done in India. Kuch nahi hota, mm -hmm. Nothing is done. Now nothing is done, yeah. No, nah, nothing. As far as the clinical trial, once the clinical trial starts, a lot of investigations also is being done. But starting from blood uh, estimation and for all organs and other things. Now, bigger companies are coming to India. They are, because in our laboratory, I have seen some of the, uh, I, I'm not remembering the name, they are coming to audit, seeing the infrastructure, mm -hmm. whether they can, perform these tests or not. But that mm. data is in, analyzed over there, either in mm. US or in Europe. You see, so they are trying to uh, get hold of uh, uh, good institutions in India where good laboratory practice will be there. The, the, a lot of things will be there, audit. But I think this is the trend, probably because it will become cheaper for them. Yeah, of course. I mean that that is completely driven by economics. The whole reason, uh, as I said, the whole reason we do not make the molecules ourselves 
yeah. is because of economics. It is, it is like 10 times more expensive, if not yeah. more. Because I, I remember we took part uh, uh, from, uh, we, I was in the private sector, the uh, uh, development of the rotavirus vaccine, which is the commonest cause of diarrhea in children. So it took about 10 years, but uh, the most of the uh, clinical trial data and other things was done over here and it was sent to US for mm -hmm. analysis. And then they yes. get All India Institute was also there and so many other organization. Mm, yeah, mm. It's, a, it's a very, very like interdisciplinary, lots of, lots of yeah, um, yeah. hands that yeah. like, come together for this. That's a very common thing in drug disco. It's a very uh, diverse yeah. field. If India has money and the infrastructure, in everything can be done, but unfortunately it is not there. No, the research part is not, not done there. Absolutely no. not. In all fields. Yeah, I mean, this is, this is a general thing, as I said, that R&D in India is, is, you know, it's it's not, it has never been up to the mark. Yeah. Uh, one oh. thing I also find is that doctors, so the practicing doctors in US or other advanced countries, so they are involved in research. In India, I think the practicing doctors mostly do practice and the research ecosystem is not in say hospitals or maybe not so developed. It may be because we have a lot of patient burden and less number of doctors. So they don't get mm. the time. No, no, it, it is not the, that is not the problem. There is a problem uh, over here in India. There is a very uh, peculiar notion that whatever is being done in the private sector is uh, to should be taken with a pinch of salt and whatever is done in the government sector is all okay but that is not true that is not mm, true there are a very, very good, good point people. actually yeah that that's a that's a like that's and, a very good point indeed you see that yes. is the reason that is the reason uh, if you want to get funding as in the private thing you, you must be do you have all the machineries you can do everything but you have to get the funding they will not give you the fund that is the problem and this notion should change. They have to change it. They have to incorporate good private. Uh, because the, here the notion is that if you give it to a private, he will make money. That is, I think, that has to change. <laughs> because you in US, you see, everything is private. Yeah, I mean, it's true. I mean, most of the, most of the research that, like pharmaceutical research, most of it is actually in, in, in pharma companies and that's completely private. Yeah. No, and, apart, apart, apart from pharma companies also, yeah, just, I can give you an example. Uh, the uh, the uh, Armed Forces Institute of Pathology in Washington was mm -hmm. one of the, it is like uh, we always want to have all the fascicles with us, whatever they will say is the goal. You see what has happened. They had to shut down because the taxpayers revolted. Mm. Then what are you doing? Well, it is very sad, but it is true. So yeah. on, on, on the other hand, look at SpaceX. Yeah, you just see. So that is SpaceX now like overtaken NASA pretty much. I mean, he, here also, generation. as far as artificial intelligence, let, let me know. Here, many people are trying to do. But you see, whenever I ask them, people have a notion that artificial intelligence will take over your mind and do everything. That is not true. You have to teach the machine, right? Of course. <laughs> people are thinking artificial intelligence. No, no, no. It, that is why in pathology, uh, like histopathology, it has not taken up. They are trying their best, but there are so many variability that it is still not getting up. I mean, so, machine learning is a so the, uh, so in 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 the topic of machine learning, I think I mm -hmm. people asked a bunch of questions, so I, I should probably expound on on that a little bit. Um, I mean, I I I, I am in that I am in that field, so mm -hmm. I'm quite aware of the of the recent advancements. So the technology, the, the algorithms and what people use are quite old. I mean, they, they have been invented in the 80s and, and most of them in the 80s and 90s. 
but because of the processing power of computers they did not mm -hmm. come into the mainstay until yeah. let's say 2015 2010 after the okay. 2010s okay. so after that point computers became powerful enough then uh, the, these these algorithms could be executed at a, in a reasonable manner in a reasonable time mm. and then they they started be, like started becoming applicable to various different things like you know for example now your phone has these um these machine learning algorithms for the camera right for processing yeah, the yeah. images yeah yeah this was never possible before because mm. the processing capability did not exist mm. The algorithms right. are very old. I mean, they, they really are very old. Yeah, yeah. The recent advance advances are just are, are small by comparison, um, algorithm wise. But it's just a matter of the processing power that it is now has entered the mainstream. And I, I really do not like using the term artificial intelligence because that that is a that's often a often understood very wrongly. If you say machine learning, then that's that's sort of a better term in my opinion. Yeah, yeah. So that's so it's just a tool that that we yeah. are using to right. advance yeah. our goals and 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 further research. Okay, so I think. Uh -huh. uh, do does anybody have any more queries or then we can no i just through. had a i just had a comment mm -hmm. on ai um, i used to work on natural language processing for a while okay. so that involves some degree of sure. uh, yeah. you know um, i don't think we are in a position to confidently say that there is no risk that ai poses i mean just look at it simply if you can write a program that is able to modify itself, right? Essentially, machine learning is to some extent doing that. Mm -hmm. If you write a program that can modify itself, then you really have to have very, very serious checks and balances. Yeah. Because it could, it could conceivably go out of control. And if you look at the... Uh, I mean, if you search through the, if you scan through the web, you will see that a lot of decent scientists also are expressing their apprehensions regarding uh, unmitigated AI, uh, if I may use that term. Is it really 100% foolproof? No, no. No, I, I would not say that. Of course not. As you correctly said that, if if you because you are now we are developing these these programs that can modify itself yeah uh, we are so there is there is some risk that and there is of of course there is ethical concerns here it's not 100% safe but what i am against is calling this a magic bullet as many people thinks mm. that it is just a solution to any of the problems and it will it put people out of jobs and so on. Yeah, that is nonsense. <laughs> that, just, that's what. Uh, yeah, they'll, but, just, but, they'll just move on to other jobs. There will be exactly. other jobs created. Sure. Yeah. But yeah, I mean, it's, it's not a, it's not a, it's not a black and white thing that it is. No, this is I don't think it is absolutely like it. It cannot go wrong, sort of a situation. I don't know. I mean, imagine AI triggering a nuclear war. <laughs> I mean, that's possible. That's AI, AI could do that because uh, you know the program is modifying itself, learning, and uh, what if it at at some stage it goes wrong? It could be, lead to catastrophic situations like that. But then the president also could go insane. That could also happen. So not only AI, human beings could also go berserk. Yeah, it's, it's... Yeah. I, I will worry about that first of all. Exactly. Exactly. Right now, right now, as it stands, um, uh, technology going that far before that happens, it's more likely that the human exactly. factor will overwhelm itself. Exactly. So yeah. Thanks. But, okay. So uh, thank you, Deepanda. I think uh, uh, you introduced us and gave a very 
broad overview of uh, the drug development process and a lot of us uh, learned something new today. And more importantly, we had a very nice discussion and you answered a lot of queries that a lot of people had. And so all of the participants who joined us today would go uh, with something enriching after the session. So thank you so much for taking time and uh, presenting this session for the benefit of all. And a lot uh, those who could not join due to paucity of time, I think they will be able to watch it over YouTube and then uh, benefit from your experience in the field. So. Thank you so much. And now I think uh, we will stop the recording. And if anybody would want to stay for a more discussion, then they can stay for another five minutes and then we would close the meeting. Thank you for organizing the session. It was my pleasure to share my are, experience here. Are you all coming to the reunion or not?